those of you who've been lucky enough to travel abroad in the recent past, think about the first things you wanted to do and see. You probably had some museums and historical landmarks to check out, but I'll bet that you also had eating food near the top of your to-do list. And not just because you're hungry, but also because so much of actually experiencing the culture of a new place is trying the food. It's why we try pasta in Italy, and why we try tacos and tamales in Mexico. And it's definitely why Anthony Bourdain tried warthog anus in Namibia. <laughs> and not just for the TV ratings. So every destination has a dish or a cuisine associated with it. And that's because food is so deeply tied to our culture and our identity. What we cook is an expression of who we are and where we come from. And when we're traveling abroad, Trying the food from that country is a great way to experience the culture firsthand. In the same respect, when you're moving to a new country, cooking and eating the food from your home is a great way to feel connected and nostalgic about that place and bring you back to your roots and your foundation. Sharing that food with other people can instantly connect you to people very much unlike yourself. Commensality is a stepping stone for building friendships and communities and strengthening ties between disparate groups. So today, there's also a growing trend among governments in middle power countries to create government-funded gastrodiplomacy programs, which basically serve as a tool to introduce the cuisine of a country to a foreign audience in order to gain awareness for the country itself. So as our world becomes increasingly globalized, Cooking and sharing food have become powerful tools for preserving culture outside of its cultural and geographical context. So I'm here today to talk to you about the importance of maintaining this diversity in our culinary landscape and preserving and sharing cultural traditions through food. So to start, as Americans, our food culture is a little bit muddled. First of all, uh, the food that's typically associated with the American diet isn't really good food. I'm thinking mostly of like ballpark franks and fast food cheeseburgers, things that taste really good but aren't getting any Michelin stars. And second of all, America is a country of immigrants. So our cuisine is constantly being influenced by food that's coming in from different countries. And because of that, even though I'm a fifth generation American, I never really strongly identified with a specific American food culture until fairly recently when I was geographically removed from it. And that happened in the summer of 2010 when I went to Uganda to live and work on a farm with a farmer named Bob and his family in order to learn more about agriculture and food systems in developing countries. So while I was there, about four weeks into my trip, I got malaria, which unfortunately is very common in Uganda. It's much like getting the flu here. And I knew this. I had been to malaria endemic countries before. I was well aware that with a quick diagnosis and proper drugs, it was totally treatable. But being a stereotypical American, when I was sitting in that little rural hospital and that doctor told me that I did in fact have malaria, I freaked out. I was really scared. And I think it was the first time in my adult life that I felt truly homesick. So in the following weeks, even though I couldn't actually eat anything, I was dreaming about American food. And whenever I got a chance, I would text my sister and ask her what she was eating and what she had eaten earlier that day and what everyone else around her was eating. And I was dreaming about chocolate and coffee and bread. And I think the, che the food that I missed the most, and this won't come as a surprise to anyone, was cheese. And <laughs> ironically, during that week when I was getting better, my entire extended family was vacationing in the state of Wisconsin, cheese capital of America. <laughs> so this food homesickness is, was really weird to me. It was something that I had never experienced before. But it's actually really common among people who are moving into a new country and adjusting to a new culture. Reconciling that old and familiar food with the new unfamiliar food is part of a larger process called acculturation. And although this is different for everyone, cultural anthropologists have mapped it into roughly four stages. So the first is the honeymoon stage, which is pretty self-explanatory. It's basically when everything is new and exciting and you're like on an adventure in this new country. 
And then the next is the hostility or the conflict phase, um, <laughs> at which point those differences in culture become grating and everyday life can become a little bit frustrating. And then you move up through the adjustment phase when you can objectively identify the differences in culture and kind of approach it with a more lighthearted sense of humor. And then finally, there's the home stage, at which point you're about as close to assimilation as you're gonna get. Most people adapt either a bicultural identity or relinquish their old cultural identity entirely. And it should be noted that these stages are much more pronounced when you're moving into a culture that is starkly different from your original culture and also when you have little to no contact with your home culture. So I found a lot of references to them in literature for Peace Corps volunteers, for example. So I was never in Uganda or anywhere else long enough to go through all four of these stages. But in a country like America that has a large immigrant population, people are going through this U-curve of cultural adjustment all the time. It's been well documented, and there's actually a lot of really interesting literature about the effect it can have on food purchasing and food consumption habits among immigrant communities. So one study of Korean immigrants in America found that when they first moved here, they were very venturesome in their purchase of American food products. Um, and then they kind of quickly moved into the hostility phase, at which point they reverted back to purchasing more traditional Korean food products, and then made their way up to the home phase, at which point they were purchasing those American food products with about the same frequency that they had been when they first moved here. There's also multiple studies showing that when non-Western immigrants move into Western countries like America, their rates of obesity and diabetes rise to about the same levels as those that are in their new adopted home. And this trend is associated directly with their increased consumption of Western foods. And finally, a study of Mexican immigrants in America found that in just one generation, the influence of the Mexican diet was almost entirely lost. So as these communities are moving into second and third and fourth generations, they're losing some of the traditional foods to make way for the American foods. And with that, they're losing some of that sense of culture and identity. And this experience was actually illustrated beautifully in a recent New York Times article in which the author herself and the subject she interviews discuss desperately trying to hold on to those recipes and culinary traditions from their parents and their grandparents in order to maintain a connection to family and to their home country. She says, quote, over generations, palates evolve and customs fade. The old ways of cooking are quietly forgotten. So in an effort to kind of curb that loss of cultural capital, as social scientists like to call it, uh, me and two of my friends from graduate school, Ryan and Pete, started Global Kitchen, which is a social enterprise that hosts immigrant-led cooking classes. And our classes are based in the New York City area, and all of the chefs that we work with teach the cuisine from their home country. So they'll be, t they'll be home cooks, and they'll sometimes be classically trained, trained chefs, but they always teach traditional foods to our students that are common in their countries of origin. Some of these foods are well known to an American audience, such as Filipino adobo and Indian curry, and some you'd be hard pressed to find in any restaurant, even in New York City. A good example of that is Egyptian koshery, which is actually incredibly popular in Egypt, but because it's so labor intensive and there's so little demand for it in the United States, there's no real justification for serving it in restaurants here. So one of the things that we really like to emphasize in our classes is the cultural and historical traditions and context behind the food. So this can come from a chef instructor talking about cooking this particular dish with her parents and her grandparents when she was growing up, or it can mean talking about trade routes and a history of colonization and how those influence the dishes and the ingredients in a particular country. A really good example of that would be the Spanish influence on Filipino cuisine, bringing in dishes like paella. And then finally, we like to incorporate cultural elements into the classes themselves. So with our Ethiopian class, our chef instructors perform a traditional Ethiopian coffee ceremony. And this is a part of daily life in Ethiopia. Um, it usually involves roasting beans over a fire or stove, and then grinding them by hand with a mortar and pestle, or with a coffee grinder in our case, and then brewing the, the coffee in front of your guests and serving it to them. And in Ethiopia, it's meant to signify friendship and hospitality towards the people that you're welcoming into your home. 
So what we really want to do with Global Kitchen, besides the classes, is create this platform for cultural exchange. And we also want to record these recipes and these culinary traditions that otherwise wouldn't be documented. And we're not the only ones with this idea. Some of you may have heard of Eat With, which is a service that's rapidly expanding over the world. And it's basically a way to connect to hosts in a country that you're traveling to and then go to their home and they'll serve you a meal. There's also a really awesome restaurant in Pittsburgh called Conflict Kitchen. And they only serve cuisines from countries with which the United States is in conflict. So this would be places like Afghanistan, Venezuela, and Cuba. Um, and finally, UNESCO has actually added cook specific cooking styles from countries like Japan, France, Turkey, and Mexico to its intangible cultural heritage list. And these are all small examples of gastro diplomacy, which I mentioned earlier. And defined broadly simply means communicating your culture and your identity through food. Um, but in the public diplomacy context, gastro diplomacy is actually a tool that governments use to tap into people's emotional connection to food in order to gain influence and raise brand awareness about the country itself in an international setting. And it's also a fantastic way to encourage tourism to your country. So the first country to do this was Thailand in 2002. It started the Global Thai Program. And at the time, there were only 5,000 Thai restaurants in the world. And their goal was simply to raise that number to 8,000. And they did this by helping Thai restaurateurs in all over the world gain access to funding and ingredients that they needed in order to build up their restaurants. So as you may have guessed, based solely on the number of Thai restaurants in Brooklyn alone, the program was incredibly successful. Today, there are upwards of 20,000 Thai restaurants in the world. Thai food has become one of the most well-known international cuisines. And Thailand itself is a wildly popular tourist destination. And so other governments saw this, and they followed suit. Korea started a gastro diplomacy program in 2009. It was a $40 million program. And now, just a few years later, Korean food is consistently ranked among the top American food trends. Taiwan started a program that helped throw gourmet food festivals on the island, and also started a think tank, the sole purpose of which was to figure out new ways to introduce Taiwanese restaurants and coffee shops and food products to a foreign audience. And Peru started a gastro diplomacy program that helped make Peruvian food more recognizable to a wider audience. And Peru itself was recently ranked the number one culinary destination in the world. And it expects to see $1 billion in culinary tourism just this year. So this might seem really simple, but gastro diplomacy is actually really working as a tool to introduce audiences to the food and the culture of a new country. Food is an easy and incredibly effective way to introduce an unfamiliar culture to a foreign audience and then subtly over time make the country itself more approachable, as was the case with Thailand. And on a more personal level, sharing our food culture with others and letting them share theirs with us can create an immediate connection. Um, this is a picture of me mixing cake batter in Uganda and simultaneously trying to make gaucho pants happen. <laughs> but <laughs> when, I was, when, when I was there, <laughs> we cooked together as a family nearly every day. And we usu were usually cooking the food from the farm. So it was during those moments when we were cooking and we were eating that we actually got to know each other outside of the context of work. And it was also during those moments when I felt most included in the family unit itself and most connected to Ugandan culture. Similarly, since starting Global Kitchen, uh, I've been able to witness connections like that happen all the time. Uh, one example that really stood out to me was when we had an Ethiopian class and we had three couples come in who had all adopted children from Ethiopia. And they wanted to learn about the food and the culture in order to share that experience with their children. I thought it was a really wonderful example of what Global Kitchen is trying to do, and it inspired me to continue working to preserve culture through food. And I hope it's through this example and others out there that will inspire you to do the same. Thank you so much.